Hello, welcome to Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. Our guest today is Susanna Kalming. Susanna, are you ready to be great today? I am. Susanna is a former U.S. Air Force medic, twice deployed to the Middle East, with 22 years and a successful career in healthcare and strategic partnerships in biotechnology and clinical research. She is the daughter of a first-generation Korean immigrant and World War II and Korean War veteran dad. She has an MBA in healthcare, management, and master's in political science. She serves an, as an executive board member for Women in Bioscience, is a member of the American Legion Post 53, and Stella Kum Kawanis, hope I said that right. In 2021, she lost her race, her race for DuPont City Council, and in 2022, lost to the incumbent for the state representative in the 20th district in the, 20, in the, in the state of Washington. So then thanks for being here today. So first, what, what do you do for fun? Thank you for segueing into fun first after two campaign losses. Um, I'm actually just starting to figure that back out. I've been campaigning for the past two years. So I was just telling one of my friends the other day that I need to just get back to finding what makes me happy and being able to be myself and be silly and not have to worry about being politically correct or offending someone. So I'm in the process of kind of finding out what that is again. And, you know, the last two summers have been stolen from me with campaigning. So I'm looking forward to getting outdoors more and doing some traveling and eating a lot of food and maybe putting some weight back on and doing all the fun things. So what kind of places have you traveled to before? Oh, so in the military, I was super fortunate. You know, I grew up being a military brat and we kind of lived all over, but then when I joined myself, I was able to go to Spain. Um, I was also previously married to it. So most of that time was overseas living in Germany and living in Korea and um, obviously being deployed to the Middle East. And I love it because when you're stationed overseas, everything is a 30 minute flight, two hour flight. So living in South Korea, that was pretty awesome. Not what, only what, what to- part of Korea are you in? Were you in Seoul? Seoul and Seoul. Yeah. yeah. So me, quick flight everywhere. Yeah, right? me, me, me and my family were there for three years or so. Great. It was yeah. a great experience. And like for me, like we were all over the place. My my wife, oldest daughter, they like Germany the best. I like Italy the best. My two other kids like Korea the best. Yeah. So we are different places. So the place you've been, what's the place you did not like? Oh, I can't say that there's a place I didn't like. Um I can't really say. Yeah, there's never been a place that's, I mean, if you're in a crappy situation and you're with good people, it kind of makes up for the environment. So I it can't does, really, it? yeah. I realize that. Like, yeah. you can have the best boss, so, you know, best place. So we've been in Hawaii. If your boss sucks, then Hawaii is going to suck for you. Yes. Yeah, that is so true. I went on this amazing trip um, a few years back and the company wasn't that great. And we were in this beautiful environment surrounded by the islands and just it was supposed to be complete serenity but the company I was with wasn't that great and so it kind of took away from that moment but um gives me an excuse to go back so you say outside stuff you talk about hiking or snow skiing or snow skiing or exactly what yeah so I'm a hiker I grew up in Texas so we were not exposed to snow sports at all so I kind of feel like I misplaced Texan because I'm not into snow sports now, but I always try every year I'll take a lesson, but it always ends up with me, um, you know, at the spa instead of on the slopes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm fine with that. So what part of Texas do you grow up in? El Paso. El Paso. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I graduated high school from Odessa, Texas. Yes. I can tell yeah. with the accent. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So talk about the, um, the woman in bioscience. Yes. What I actually that? just stepped down from that position and um, it's, for women that are in the bioscience industry, they're underrepresented. And that group is just such a wonderful group of women that are coming from all diverse backgrounds. There's actually a DE&I component to women in bioscience. They have a YWIB program, which is just getting younger girls into the sciences and math early in their educational development to kind of segue more into a healthcare environment. Um, but it's really a networking for job opportunities, for social events, for building your professional network outside of the office. Everyone's remote now. So Women in Bio allows you to connect with women that maybe have the same aspirations, but certainly women that you can learn from. And what is a certain, certain grade or age for this? 
No, not at all. In fact, um, the Seattle chapter, many of the women work at like Fred Hutch or the University of Washington. And there's a huge life science industry here in downtown Seattle specifically. Um, with everything kind of being decentralized, I work in the clinical trial space specifically with decentralizing clinical trials, which means not everyone's going to the clinic. We're looking at how we can actually bring the clinical trial to a patient's home. So I, I saw this somewhere a long time ago, and I asked this on the podcast once while. No one has a good answer. Okay. Maybe you do, you do or don't, right? <laughs> okay. Or just do a best guess. So I know there's somewhere out there that says, like, you know, uh, females out of school, 80% of them, like, really love STEM. Like, they want to do STEM. By high school, that drops down to 10%. So somewhere from fifth grade to 10th grade, we lose like 70% interest in STEM for females. Do you think it's the societal pressures or like, what do you think that is? I think there's a lot of factors. I think growing up and being a teenager, especially from my own personal experience, is one of the most challenging times in your lives, especially as a young woman. And um, as you can imagine, hormones are going crazy. And so you're going through probably some boy craziness and your priorities get a little bit skewed. And you're also just trying to figure out who you are as a person at that age. So you, you might lose interest in it, but also, um, if you're not surrounded by other girls that kind of make STEM cool, or if you don't see kind of the long-term effects, you can lose interest in those things a little bit faster because maybe your friends aren't participating in STEM or you're not surrounded by that positive influence, maybe back at home. And STEM is so great, not only because it provides you with the foundational core of what you need to get into the life sciences or health or technology field, but it's really exposing you to other women who have common interests or, or you're just kind of synergizing off of even your differences that you have with other young women. And um, I think societal norms also play into that. That's That's just my best guess. I don't know if that's the the proper answer for what's going on everywhere. But um, I think it also has a lot, you know, coming out of politics, I'm sure state funding into STEM programs is extremely important. And, and I really hope that that's a priority for the urban areas that are un underfunded. But for the areas that it is funded, I, I certainly hope we can keep that going. So from your time of women in bioscience, did you see that females are drawn to a certain type of STEM? Like oh, most go to engineering, most of science, like do you see anything along those lines? It's it's all over the place. The core classes, of course, you know, the math and the science. I think for the biotech space, which is what I'm in, the pharmaceutical industry, it tends to be women dominated, um, which is quite interesting because we're still underrepresented in the life sciences field as a whole. Um, but I I think the majority of the women are in the life sciences field, which which is pharmaceuticals. And the women virus, is that a nonprofit? I actually don't know. That's a good question. I do believe they are a nonprofit organization. Um, and that's a good segue into checking out the Seattle chapter of women in bioscience to get more involved. They have open houses all the time. So you can certainly go. And I believe they are opening it up to, it's obviously called women in bioscience, but we obviously work with our male counterparts all the time. So I believe our open houses are something that we work with men. And one of the um, women that's in women in bioscience was actually saying she has had really great male mentors as being a woman in bioscience versus how she's um, fared to her female colleagues, maybe because it, it is so competitive and and women, sometimes we can be very nasty to each other. And so sometimes our mentors you, come you from said, the most- You said it, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I, I will straight admit that. That is, I, I don't think that's a secret and that's probably a whole not another topic on feminism and what that actually means, but yeah. So one time it's kind of like interesting nowadays, like I know a lot of females who say they're mentors of guys, and a lot of guys who are saying they're mentors are actually females. So I think it's an interesting dynamic going on right now. Yeah, for sure. And I feel so, you know, with the, with the Me Too movement, I think there's a lot of men that are scared to talk to women. Um, and there's so many things that used to be normal that aren't normal. Granted, most of those things are justifiably things that needed to change. Um, however, I think now we have this effect where men are completely scared to talk to women in general, and that's in the office and outside of the office. But with that being said, some of my best mentors are men, and they have treated me with nothing but respect. And um, I do have strong women that I work with, obviously, that I admire. And I'm proud to call a lot of those women my friends. But we all do talk about how the cattiness does exist because it is so competitive. Um, so with that being said, you know, if you kind of keep the big picture in mind, I think you can set aside that we're all professionals. 
Yeah, I know my time in military, I mean, it was like, this is my experience, like when a female's in charge, she'll destroy other females, right? <laughs> Every single time. Like, we were like, man, like, it's almost like the female, we were like, I had it hard to get here. I'll make up for everyone else. And we could never steal that from a guy's point of view, right? But every, every single time a female, they're in charge, guy who get, we kind of get breaks and all, but the females, yeah, they get, get other females no slack to beat them. Yeah, and that's actually a good point. So I have a couple of friends that have um, sons and daughters and my mom being Korean, she's raised her three daughters to be, she was um, a nature versus nurture person, not nurture versus nature. And so she raised us, with like this bamboo stick was our discipline, you know, and we would come home. And if that bamboo, it was actually a spoon. If the bamboo spoon wasn't there at the front door, we knew one of us was in trouble. And we all would look at each other like, what did you do? What did you do? And we were, none of us knew what was going on. And sometimes I think my mom just did it to keep us on our toes. But my friends that have daughters, um, I I noticed that they want their sons differently from their daughters. And I asked one of my friends, because I started to see it was a common theme. And and I said, Nikki, what's what's the difference? Why are you so much harder on Annabelle than you are on Ben? And she said, because I know Annabelle's going to have it harder in society. She's going to have it tough. And I don't want her to be so sensitive to where that she's experiencing something in the real world and she's not prepared for it. So I'm giving her tough love. And um, it's hard to watch, but I'm, I'm also listening to it. And I'm like, man, I could totally resonate with that. So if someone joins a uh, women in bioscience, what's the benefit of it? What do they get out of joining? Yeah, I think it's mainly the networking aspect. We are able to kind of have industry knowledge before it gets to a press release. And a lot of the, some of what you read in the press release or a lot of what you read in press releases are for investors to know that you are doing your due diligence with the money that's been invested in your company or your clinical project. And with women in bioscience, there's a lot of the, um, behind the scenes action that takes place. So we're able to tell each other like, hey, I know someone's going to be going um, to a different job or getting promoted soon. There's going to be an opening here. You should apply for it now or get your resume together now. So we really do look out for each other and try to provide each other with a professional network and career opportunities before it hits LinkedIn. So next, talk about the American Legion post 53. Now, first of all, that's different from the Veterans and foreign wars, right? Yeah. That's why the difference between them and all that kind of stuff. So I, I don't know that much about the VFW. I've attended a few of their events. I do know that there is one in the Tacoma area that needs people to obviously join. I know that post the American Legion does more community events that are focused on helping out everyone, not just um, people that are veterans of the armed, armed forces. So from the perception of being a Legion member versus a uh, VFW member is it seems to focus more on the community versus the veteran themselves. And I'm sure the VFW does community events as well. Um, in fact, I, I had the opportunity when I was campaigning to go speak at a few of those. I know the VFW, I know more, they used to get a lot of criticism for like being like a old, studgy Vietnam <laughs> war veteran, 55 year white male, not wanting to reach out to the younger generation. Is that is that still the case? Or is that getting better at that? Or you know? Yeah, that is actually not the case. And I I think it's because you don't have a choice. I mean, there's um, it's funny when I go to Home Depot, there's those couple of parking lots in the front that say like veterans only. And I always want to park there, but not for the reason that, you know, I deserve to be there because I'm a veteran, but I always want someone to say something to me because I don't look like I'm a veteran. And so there's a lot of people that have served that don't look like that stereotype anymore. And so you see the younger population starting to park in those parking spots now. And um, just because someone doesn't look like a veteran doesn't mean that they didn't serve, obviously. And during the global war on terror, um, the standards, of course, the demand was so high that they did lower the regular standards to accept people into a lot of programs. And so you have a lot of, um, I won't say this, but I'll back, I'll digress off of that one specifically, because I don't want to take away from the core of this specific group, but you have a lot of people that um, did get in that probably shouldn't have gotten in under normal under normal staff circumstances. Um, but yeah, the VFW, now you look at it and it's so diverse and that's the way it, I mean, our military is one of the most diverse organizations in the world. And I think we're now truly starting to reflect that. Did you ever meet Daniela Young? No. So you know what I'm talking about, right? I don't know. So she wrote the Susan here, but a while ago, Bunker Labs, uh, served in the military, wrote a book, whatever. And she did a blog post one time where she parked somewhere in the veteran space. And this old guy walked over and said, I remember she served like eight years as a military intelligence captain. And this old guy told her, tell your husband, I said, thank you for his service. 
And she said okay. she just lost it. She yeah. said she felt bad afterwards because she probably didn't mean anything. Yeah, she said just lost it. Like, oh. Yeah, for sure. And um, when I was married to the military, people would say, you know, oh, thank you. Thank your husband for his service. And I'm like, oh, I serve too. But, and people don't mean that in a negative way. They just don't know. But I truly think, especially with Tulsi Gabbard being a veteran and being in the political eye, having that female presence more and having the military population really be a great visual for what the general population looks like is really a wonderful thing to see. And I think it sheds light on more of the minority population and um, to their credit to get the acknowledgement that they've deserved the whole time. And you always tend to hear the negative aspects on the failures or the statistics on crime. But I think we need to start highlighting the accomplishments, especially because some so many of those stem from having a military foundation or growing up in the military. I think you remember this meme, which is this event that Carrie Judah put on the women's aviation. Yeah. I never forget this, this, uh, the woman retired Air Force Colonel, 35 years in the Air Force, like 20 years as a senior person on this Air Force base. And she told us once a month, some jackass would ask her, where's the bathroom at? Or where's the, my pass is at? Like some menial, low-level admin assistant, right? And I'm like, man, after all this time, you said, I put up this bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, I think the more ex- the more people see um, the capabilities and women in leadership positions, I think it's just going to become normal. And that's what I'm hoping for everything. And I, I think we're still in that transition process is that it's not normal because it's there's still disparities out there that and there's still a lot of um, gaps that need to be filled so next i, I should know this but i have no idea what a, what a kelwanis is still a kumkakwanis is it like the lions club or whatever your club or something like that, or what of, is that? Yeah. and so um the one in stellicum meets very early thursday mornings and i tend to zoom in more than i'm able to make it there in person but i'm also back at work and um but they are a community driven organization and mayor murray and um um, Scott, uh, Sam Scott, who's on the Silicon School Board, they do such a wonderful job of bringing speakers in from government organizations, nonprofit organizations to speak to the Kiwanis. And they also have local community initiatives that they're doing. So for example, when there was the King Tide, a lot of Silicon got um, damaged. And so the Kiwanis Club went out there and re refinished and rehabbed a lot of the communities. That's also nice to see, but they're doing it all the time. And so at 41 years old to start to be involved in that is pretty cool for me, especially because I'm trying to bring in more younger people to the Kiwanis. It tends to be just like you were talking about the stereotypical older person. And I think they also, they want younger people to be involved. And I know 41 isn't young, you know, but it's not old either. And um, if we can get some more 40 year olds in there, I think it's going to be great. And switching to to your mother, she's a first generation immigrant. Yes. And how did she come over here? Can you tell that story? Yeah. So she, um, her first husband was in the military. She actually lived in Germany before she moved over to the States. So for her, and that was your father, right? No. So her first, so I have two older sisters and that's their father. And um, he was Hispanic. And so she knows Spanish very well. And, um, but her first duty assignment being a military wife was in Germany. So she had this extremely heavy Korean accent um, being stationed in Germany and in Germany at the time, they were like, no, you need to assimilate and you need to learn German. We're not going to change our language. Yeah. Germans English. don't mess around. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. But um, she she knows German and she knows Spanish. And, um, then she married. Um, so then they eventually got assigned to the States and that didn't work out. And then my mom met my biological dad and had me, and, um, that unfortunately also didn't work out, but my stepdad is the one that's raised my sisters and I, and he, um, is the one that's the Korean war veteran and, and also served in world, world war two. I know you do a lot of posts about your, 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 your stepdad. I'll say your, your real dad. And you really like, he, he's basically your dad, right? Yeah. 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 He is, he is, I brag about him. I can never say enough good things about him because he, this is a man that has um, no biological children of his own. And he married a woman with three kids and has raised us all. And we all general, it's hard for me to say stepdad because he's just always been the male figure in my life. And how old were you when he, when he came into your life? I was in the Oh, sixth grade, I think. Yeah. yeah. So pretty young and very impressionable. So you're, obviously. you're almost just about to get hit off when you get you then. Oh, so, so that had to be a challenge. Oh, for sure. I'm sure it was for him, you know, with inheriting three young daughters. He's, you know, 
he's done a great job, <laughs> but we put him through hell. <laughs> and, he, and he's like retired, retired now, right? Yes. Yeah. And he's retired, I think three times from the Air Force, from the GSA. And then he was a real estate agent and did, he's kind of a jack of all trades. How about your mom? She, she retired too. They just stay at home, chilling out, so to speak, watching TV. Oh, so there's a 20 year age difference between my, um, my mom and my stepdad and they keep each other on their toes. You know, my, um, dad is more of a homebody now he's 96, but he still goes to the gym three days a week. And he has a group of retired guys and they will go to Burger King afterwards and have coffee and, you know, shoot the shit and just have a good time. And then my mom, um, is she's just, every time I call her, she's doing something different. And for me campaigning, I think it was also her campaigning. She loved baking cookies and giving them out to everyone. And she was such a huge part of that. And if she saw a sign that was knocked over on the side of the road, she would pull over and put it back up. And you still live pretty close to them, right? Yeah. So like within walking distance, I think. Yeah. Within walking distance, which is probably too close, but um, <laughs> she has a house key and I can't seem to get that back from her. But um. Yeah, about a mile down the road. Yeah, I think you might live closer to my parents than I I do. Yeah, we're yeah, pretty close. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, so talk about the Air Force time. So did your your did your dad influence you to join the Air Force? Yeah. So um, when my so my biological dad was Army, and I remember seeing him soak his uniform in like a mixture of starch and water, and then he would hang dry it. And he dried it in such a way to where it looked like cardboard. So when he got in it, it was literally like his arms. I were, remember that. Yeah. 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 And um, he always had this, you know, the side part with the hair slicked and very handsome man. And um, I was influenced, obviously, by what it looked like, what it what what being a soldier looks like on as far as the appearance. Um, but I was so young, and and he was TDY quite a bit when my sisters and I were growing up. And so we just knew what it looked like and we got to experience the army housing and things like that. And then um, my mom married my stepdad and he was retired to Air Force and showed us the Air Force bases. And I was like, oh my God, why would anyone else join any other branch of the service? The Air Force has air conditioning, they have pools and golf courses and everyone's so nice and they're always in a great mood. And um then I talked to a recruiter. I, I kind of always knew I was going to join the Air Force. But when I talked to a recruiter, um, one of the things I also always knew was I was always going to do the reserves. I was never going to do active duty because I didn't want to lose my whole identity in the military. Um, but with that being said, the unit that I was a part of had plenty of volunteer opportunities to deploy. So I did get to experience active duty life for probably about a period of maybe two and a half years. And um crazy thing is, is I end up marrying a guy in the army anyways. So <laughs> I reverted back to, I guess, old habits, but um, yeah, I loved, I loved the air force. It is probably the best thing that I've ever done with my life. And, um, and has set me on a trajectory to, I think, doing other great things. And I still don't know what those great things are, but yeah. To Do you have any uh, air force or diplomacy stories you can tell us? Probably <laughs> if you were in my inner circle and we weren't on this podcast, <laughs> I'd tell you a lot, Jason, but um, just from being a medic, I think the best thing to share with people is that not everyone walks away from their deployments with a horror story or a PTSD story. And, and I say that because I, I really want people to believe that the military can be a good thing. And it's so unfortunate that there are people that are suffering from PTSD and a physical trauma um, and mental trauma that you can't see, but there, it was the greatest, it was one of the greatest experiences for me being deployed, but I also had a very rewarding job being a medic, taking care of injured soldiers and, and civilians. And, um, that's being in the healthcare field in the military is an opportunity to get away from the dog and pony show. Nobody cares that you're a general. Nobody cares that what your rank is or how many medals or coins you have. They just care like my leg is blown off. Can you put my leg back on or am I going to survive? And that really just breaks it down into the, what's the most important thing. And so when you, I've seen, you know, with my ex-husband being in the military, he was special forces and he was also a, a physician but he also had to do a part, a part of that dog and pony show, which in my opinion, being out of it and also being a reservist, there's a necessity for the dog and pony show. You know, it's the purpose of being in the, in the military is to always be ready for war. Um, but also 
So there's a lot dog and pony show and politics as well that gets in the way of doing the right thing or doing the right thing the most efficiently and the most efficient way possible. So that's the part I don't miss, but overall my experience was awesome. Yeah, dog, dog and pony show, definitely if you're an officer too, that's dog and pony show. So like a politics officer is just ridiculous, right? Yeah. So I always knew the Air Force is like different than the Army, but this is when this happened, I knew, okay, this is totally different, right? So we were in doing some kind of exercise and so Air Force people came, right? And we put them like, no, you know, army billeting, right? These jokers moved off base in a ho- the German hotel because the, our, our, our living stand not to, to their standard, right? Yeah. They were like, well, we live there. Like, what's going on? <laughs> They're like, no, yeah. this is not to our standards. This, this is not acceptable for us. And they got TDY to live off base. They yeah. Got, they got the hotels, the rental cars, everything. Yes. And this is I'm like, oh, man. And this what, is- what did I do wrong? Exactly. And this is a known thing. And um, it's it's so funny to talk to people that are in different branches of service. And they that's one of the first things they say is how good the Air Force has it. And to give you an example, and this is not to brag, but to give you an example of how different it is, you know, I would work the night shift in Iraq, take care of the soldiers. I'd get off at like seven in the morning and I'd go swimming in a Olympic sized pool. And then I'd go watch a movie in a world class theater. And then I'd go eat chow from steak and lobster that was flown in from Ramstein. And then I'd go to sleep and do it all over again. And um, I think our weapons were locked up in the Connex the majority of the time. And anytime the army would see the Air Force with our M16s, they're like, you're wearing that like it's a Louis Vuitton. Like (laughs) you're wearing it like it's an accessory. And we would just get so much crap for actually having our weapons on us. But being a medic, you know, you're not supposed to be combative. And I even felt a little weird having an M16 because I was like, what do I do with this? Other than <laughs> my qualification shooting that I have to do. Um, it, you know, I, I was a medic and I, j- I wanted to take care of you after you got shot. I didn't want to be the one doing the shooting. Yeah, and just a mess all like, I mean, mess all like no one of the military is going to have their paycheck on food. Right. Cause yeah. they can survive, but air force mess. Oh my God. Like yeah. Fine dining to his best, right? <laughs> right. Well, you'll probably still notice it now with JBLM being merged. It's, um, you know, it used to be like the good PX or the bad PX. Yeah. And the good PX is on the Air Force side and the bad or the second bad, I guess, PX was on the Army side. And so now you've kind of seen the whole base kind of step up the standards. But quality of life is so huge to morale and yeah. and the military deserves to have the best. And Sorry, but if they want to go TDY and have air conditioning. Airport, where to go. <laughs> yeah. It's not about that. <laughs> For sure. So next talk about your current role. You're um you're like you in you in bio bio healthcare, right? Yeah. And mainly clinical research. Yeah. So I've spent about the last 18 years in clinical research specifically, and it's opened my eyes to so many things. Um I think the biggest thing is the disparities in healthcare that still exist. There are so many people that rely on clinical research as care. And that just means that they either cannot access primary care or they have tried primary care and it just hasn't worked for them. And standard of care is always improving. And that's what clinical research is for, pardon. And um, people don't realize for every drug that's approved, there's thousands of dollars, millions of dollars and millions of drugs that don't get approved. So to make it through the clinical research process is a huge deal. And um, I think COVID, you know, put some doubts in science, you know, and, and there's people that question the clinical research process now is um, some of it's very valid, but to the studies that are going through that are valid and that are continuing to look for other ways to cure cancer, to look for other ways to treat mental health, dealing with non-traditional methods, such as, um, you know, hopefully legalizing shrooms to treat mental health and PTSD and um, the actual medical component of the mushroom, I think is going to be huge for our PTSD population or anyone suffering from any traumatic event. I could make this up, but I think I read somewhere where like, even when a drug is approved, like 25% of them will get disapproved later on because stuff comes out later on or something happens and they actually take stuff off the shelves. Yeah, I don't know the exact statistic, but clinical research is basically always trying to either replace what's currently out there or be something to prevent something from happening. Um, I truly hope that we can get into a mindset where healthcare is no longer reactive, it's proactive 
because I think that's really the best care that you can give yourself is just living a healthy life in the first place so that you are reducing your risk of inheriting something that's not genetic. So if it's something in the environment, obviously we have to focus on environmental issues because those can cause ailments as well within your body. But if you, obesity, for example, I mean, it's not just obesity and making bad decisions. It's social economic disparities that lead to people having obesity issues. And so growing up, I know when we were on welfare, not being able to get the healthy stuff because it wasn't covered under under the food stamp program. So, at the so time. like, is it like in the poor neighborhoods? Oh, they have like 7 Elevens, candy stores, like what's called food deserts, I think. It's always called food deserts, the, like the inner city areas. Yeah. So, right outside of McCord Air Force Base, you've probably seen it. There's a corner store that's right there. There's a dry cleaner on one side and a corner store on the other. <clears throat> and I remember moving up from Texas, the first um, thing that I learned about at the corner store was something called JoJo's. And JoJo's are just the potato wedges. And it's anything on the rotating metal sticks, right? So hot dogs, JoJo's, chicken wings, deep fried something that's just rotating there. But yeah, it's not healthy stuff, but they accepted food stamps. So I got it. So for the health, health thing, so quick question. So and those, you know, they're trying to cure all the diseases, cancer, diabetes, on and on, right? And I have to assume funding is like dispersed everywhere, right? Would it make better sense like the, in the year 2024 say, we're only going to do research on cancer, nothing else, and focus on cancer and cure that, or is that doesn't make any sense? No, it, it does make sense, but oncology is the leading indication that is already funded because it is so prevalent. Um, so again, I, I can't stress enough, we also have to spend as much money, focus and efforts and personal time on investing in yourself with just being living a healthy lifestyle. And that's not only physically, but that's mentally it's nourishing your body um, with things that make your mind happy and things that make your body happy. And I know that sounds very philosophical, but there's so much truth in, in mind and body. Is the clinical research standards in the United States same as across the world or does each country has their own standards they have to meet? Or is it like one great, I guess the World Health Organization has to do that, I'm guessing. Yeah, so there are different standards. So for example, for example, the company that I previously worked for, we did compliance for clinical research and um, that was an American-based company, and we could only do com compliance with the United States because every country does have their own regulatory board. And some countries don't even have regulatory boards, so they look to the United States for guidance. And we can provide them with guidance, and we can provide them with a letter that says, hey, you're doing research in a country that that doesn't have your own practices, but if it were to be conducted in the United States, you know, this is something that we would approve, or this is how we would go about it. So this might be a mess of question, but I suppose um, I'll make this up. Suppose um, France came with a cure for a disease, right? At the same time, we'll say Guatemala came to cure for the same disease. Would France get better credit because France is kind of well known, better science stuff versus a country like Guatemala or, or both be like, be treated equally? Yeah, so I think no matter what, the United States would look at both of the agents that, you know, quote unquote, would have the, the cure um, and do our own research on it as well. Because as I mentioned, the standards and the compliance is different for every country. But there is a lot to be said with money talks. And so if you, um, the great thing about social media is that it's also bridging the gap so that if you don't have the money to do that marketing and put out those press releases, that information can, can come and hopefully flow freely and get widely dispersed from rural areas or countries that don't have organizations to say, hey, look at what we did and what we're doing. Talk about how human trials uh, work. Like y'all just pick somebody, ran off the street, you have to have the disease, like what, what kind of protocol set up for those kind of things? Yeah. So when I was in Korea, we were working on the new smallpox vaccine. Remember when you were in the military, you got the 15 pricks on your arm and it made that really nasty scab. And Bavarian Nordic came out with a vaccine where it's just one simple vaccine, one simple immunization. And so um the consent process for that is obviously you have to go to a demographic that has the need. And in Korea at the time, any soldier that was in processing, it was a requirement to get the smallpox vaccine. So that was pretty good planning on their part to go to a population that was already going to be receiving the vaccine. And it was a phase three study. So first you have to go and you have to inform this group of young soldiers. And sometimes I would feel bad because this is their first duty assignment and they're they might be stationed up at the DMZ or they're 
away from their home for their first time. Like, another shot. Yeah. They're like another shot. Great. And now you want me to do a clinical research study. And the great thing is, is that there are so many rules and laws to protect people that, um, to prevent them from being involuntarily enrolled into a clinical trial. And so there's a consent process that someone has to go through. And I, I think it was like 22 or 24 pages, um, of a consent form that the nurse or the doctor would have to go through with a patient because you really want to inform them and they they have to make an informed decision. And it's saying no is easy. You don't have to go through 22 pages to say no. You can just hear about it and just opt out of it. But to say yes, you know, that first appointment is really a screening appointment to say, this is all of the criteria that you have to meet. And this is all of the criteria that cannot be true. So these are things that have to be true. And things are things that cannot be true about you specifically in order to participate in this clinical trial. And on TV, there are so like these poor college students doing these trials and getting paid money. Do people actually get paid money to go to the trial? Yeah, so they do get paid money. And that's after you've already agreed to consent. You um, are notified up front. That's part of a consent process and part of the ethics and uh, just how your protocol is written to say, what is the incentive? What what incentive are you providing this patient to enroll into your clinical trial? If it's a Bugatti or a Ferrari, you know, obviously that's going to be questionable and probably not approved. But if it's a, hey, we're going to give you a card and every time you come, we're going to load $25 on this card to help you cover your time and your expenses for getting here, or we'll give you a bus pass and we'll give you $50 every time you show up, something like that. But there are also clinical trials where you're just enrolling because you have tried standard of care before and nothing else is working, or you just want something that's outside of standard of care. And you want to try that first before you go through your traditional methods. So how close are we to this? So I watched a show a while ago called Your Million. It was like future scientific stuff. And what episode talk about how in the future, like 120 years from now, people, if you get sick, pose your camera cancer, you'll take a shot and the box in the shot will go kill the cancer. I, I think that's the goal. I There's a specific um, pharmaceutical company, and I think they're based out of California, that a couple of years ago, they were working on kind of a one, one shot fits all um, immunization for all kinds of viruses. I have lost track of that, so I don't know what the status of that is. I don't know what the future holds, but I will say that clinical research is um, the first step to get there. Um, because you have to make sure that it's safe. You have to make sure that you're doing it ethically and, and morally right and that the patient is informed every step of the way and that you're not doing harm to the patient. And if the patient um, is potentially going to be exposed to that harm, that they are aware of all the potential side effects that could happen if they if they participate on a trial. From your point of view, what you can see from your little, uh, where you at, what, do you, what do you think biotech's and being five, 10 years from now? It's always biotech is not going anywhere. We, we are, um, we always want to improve, right? We're, we're always striving to do better in a shorter amount of time. We're always striving to prevent diseases or eradicate diseases. So I don't think it's going anywhere. The technology is pretty amazing. If you look at all of the apps that are out there that connect to your watch and, or the ring and can monitor your sleep cycles and your breathing patterns and your heart rate. Um, all of those things are amazing. All of the knowledge that we have now, you can look back on retroactively and use that data to segue into other clinical studies or to segue into a different hypothesis to improve and advance science. As far as your own career in biotech, what, what's the future hold for you? Like you're going to be like a VP or something, or how do you see that moving on for you? I, I don't know. I'm very fortunate right now. I have such a wonderful job and I, I have such a wonderful group of people. And this is the first time I can say that and really, really mean it um, in my civilian job. And that's not to say I haven't had good people that I've worked with before, but with my current company, I genuinely appreciate and respect everyone that I work with. And that's top down and, and down up. Um, there's so much to learn in the biotech space. And so I, I feel like it will happen naturally wherever I'm supposed to be. Um, if it's the the C-suite, that's obviously great, but I really want to focus coming out of politics. I really want to focus on how I can continue to give to my community because now I don't have the dog and pony show that's guiding me. I It's really me guiding myself. So what kind of background does someone need to get into biotech? 
I'm guessing a science degree, any like any like niche degree? So actually it's quite interesting because I don't have a, a science background. So I was a medic when I was in the Air Force. And then um, I have a bachelor's degree in communications and marketing. And I have an MBA in healthcare management and then a master's in political science. And none of that has to do with, I've never taken chemistry 101. I've never taken the lab classes. Um, so it depends on if you want to have a clinical background, you obviously need those STEM classes, but if you want to be more on the operation side, you just need to have a basic understanding. And the great thing about pharmaceuticals is that there's always entry-level jobs and it's mainly on the job training. So you can start off by joining an organization such as Women in Bioscience and not have any type of healthcare background, but have exposure that way, get those on the job kind of training entry level jobs where maybe you're just a secretary or maybe you're just an admin person. And then you slowly start to learn a little bit about the roles. And um, I was pretty fortunate to fall into clinical research. Healthcare is such a broad umbrella. So to have a niche without a clinical background or clinical education is is really lucky. So you might not be able to answer this or might not know the answer, but how much pressure does big drug companies put, put on clinical research like to pass a drug through? Um, I wouldn't say that obviously the pharmaceutical company themselves has the pressure because they have investors that have funded the research. And so obviously everyone wants to pass and first one across the finish line is great because you tend to get the biggest press, but it's more on whose agent or what agent is going to be the most effective. So first doesn't always mean the best. Um, and I think we saw that kind of out of COVID with the, the different um, vaccines that came out, the different side effects from each vaccine. Obviously, there's there's a lot of pressure. Um, pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical area is a business. It's funded, but the goal is to improve the lives of patients. And we we need to just keep that at the forefront of everything. And that's why I think business development there's two separate worlds in, in pharma. There's the business development aspect or the strategic partnerships, and then there's the clinical aspects. So operations and patient care, there's a, a way to bridge that gap to where the patient is always put at the center and the patient should always be put at the center, especially when it comes to healthcare. I know the United States, I think two or three other countries, well, only countries that actually allow like medical companies like drug companies that do advertising, right? Like you know, all the same. CNN, and by Pfizer, most of the countries don't allow this. Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? What's your opinion on that? Oh, I'm kind of <laughs> kind of split on that. So obviously living in Europe and not seeing those commercials and um, relying on your healthcare provider as the sole source of information and your own research, obviously, and there's other sources of information in Europe and, and all parts of the world um, versus, com I think advertising helps puts a lot of control in the patient's hand because just because you see it on TV doesn't mean you're going to go to your doctor and say, I want that. It just means you're aware of the hopefully, product. Hopefully not anymore. Right, right. <laughs> hopefully not. Exactly. Um, but also there's so much misinformation out there and and maybe not misinformation, but it's so easy to type in your symptoms into Google, right? Yeah, WebMD. Right? WebMD, right? And, and doctors, you know, you go to your doctor appointment and you tell your doctor, I have cancer. You know, I, I read it on WebMD or I, I have, I'm sure I have um, schizophrenia or, or this, you know, I heard someone say something. My wife said she didn't say anything or something. And so it's, it's being informed that I think is the good part. Um, obviously the bad part is the reputation of it, right? Like the more you treat something like a business, the more you take away from the credibility. You of, see the same man like five times in two hours. Exactly. Like, come on, like. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think we need to focus, especially now coming out of COVID, we need to focus more on the credibility of the data and um, those that are putting out the data. And misinformation can't be something that's subjective. Misinformation has to be objective. And um, that's a whole nother rabbit hole that we can go down. But I, I think the main point is, is people are losing faith and agencies that are supposed to be the tr most trusted agencies. And we need to find a way collectively to get that back yeah a couple of days ago someone put on twitter and i answered a question someone put, someone put on twitter why is the war so messed up now i put on there because all the smart people think they're not and the unsmart people think they are yeah so oh that's a great statement um i said and i said this before but i think you can see this anywhere no matter where you're at in your life no matter where you're at at work title doesn't always mean 
you're the best qualified. The army is a perfect example of that. Yeah. Especially the army. I don't know about the Air Force. Army is a big one about that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, someone that's been in a position for 20 years doesn't mean that they're the most experienced. It just means that they've been in that position for 20 years. It's supposed to mean you've been in that position for 20 years and you are the most experienced. Your title should mean you are the most credible. But education doesn't always mean experience. Time and grade doesn't always mean best qualified. And I think until we realize and we can find a way and human resources, I think, you know, as, as doing at least making some headway and finding ways to promote people within that don't want a title change, but they want to be acknowledged for their level of expertise in a certain area without having to manage people because that's not their strong suit. And I, I think we need to emphasize that, especially in the government, you know, we have all of these elected officials and that have been there for years and they're obviously not the most qualified and people are intimidated to get into politics because they don't think they're qualified. And I'm not, there's nothing special about me, but I know, especially after meeting some of the people that are making these decisions, impacting others in a negative way that I'm more qualified and I'm only 41 years old, but I can guarantee you I'm going to approach something better than some of these people are in in current government or in positions of power. And I want people to know that like, we need more average people in government to keep common sense alive or in any elected position of power. And human resource is such a huge part of that, just acknowledging people to have common sense. And that's what motivated running for the DuPont City Council when you first ran? Yeah. And I don't want this to come off as, you know, the, not all the people in current elected positions are incompetent, or obviously we can always do better no matter what. But when I ran for DuPont City Council, um, it wasn't because I was running against anyone or any specific thing. I was just running for DuPont City Council. I wanted to serve my city, the city that I lived in. It's a city that has 70% veterans or military affiliated population. And the other 30% is not, but I wanted to serve a community that I lived in and especially working from home. I was like, I'm spending so much time here already. I need to give back to my community. So DuPont has maybe 10,000 people in it. Third retired military, third active, third, like we'll say, Griggs of Vines. This is how low down to good dirty DuPont politics is. I'm going to let Susanna tell the story. I know she knows what I'm talking about. I, I think I might know what you're talking about. And maybe this pertains to Facebook a little bit. Oh, no, somebody called you ex. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I still can't believe that. So my, my DuPont. yeah, so I was running for DuPont City Council and someone called my ex-husband. Thank God we're on great terms and we're, we had a very amicable divorce and they called DuPont, they called uh, my ex-husband and they said, they were basically trying to get dirt on me. And my ex-husband said, Susanna's the most qualified position. She's the most qualified person for that position. And if you're trying to get dirt on me, it's not going to work. And he just hung up on them and called me right afterwards and told me what happened. And I'm like, man, is there some benefit to being on DuPont city council that I don't know about? Like, I know, right? Do you get a Bugatti? Like, I don't, I don't know what is it's like, you don't believe, but if you live in DuPont, you believe it. Cause you see the politics and the Facebook groups and the nastiness yeah, going on. Like for sure. This is DuPont. Like it's not like it's New York city or it's, it's craziness. Yeah. And and that's really sad because it's so much easier to talk about someone negatively through the filter of social media. And it would always make me laugh because I would see these people um, in person and they were so nice to me and like nothing ever happened. They had both faces on. Both faces on. Both faces on. Yeah. And um, it's such a shame, but you know, I've, I don't have the energy and I didn't have the energy and I'm really trying to refocus my energy on just investing in people that are, that do have positive intentions. And I think some of the problems that we have in our current government is that you have good intentions, but you go about it the wrong way, or you don't follow the thought process all the way through. And you do that because you're surrounding yourself by an echo chamber. And if you get out of your echo chamber, you can see all of the gaps that need to be filled. And I was just talking about this last night to a group of Republicans about how we need to get out of our comfort zones and into the community, because if Republicans did a better job of exposing ourselves to the community, the community would see that they're being exploited by a lot of the people they think are supposed to have their best interest, but but don't. 
So why did you decide to run for DuPont City Council? What was your like, main reason? Yeah, I just wanted to serve. You know, we were going into it. I, I have always worked remote, but especially during COVID, you know, I was really at home. And I, I live in DuPont because my parents live there and my parents are older and I will not put them into a nursing home. I will not put them into any type of assisted living if I'm able and capable to help them myself. I, I just wasn't raised that way. And that's that's not a, a martyr statement to anyone who who does do that. But for me, it's just the way that I was brought up. I, I want to take care of my parents. And so I live very close to them. As a consequence, though, there's not a lot going on in DuPont. And I that's wanted- the best place for your single, regardless of your age. Exactly. And, and I wanted to bring more to DuPont. And not everyone is military affiliated. And people have the assumption that if you have access to the base, that you want to go on base for everything. And that's certainly not true. Because the last thing you want to do when you get home and you take off your monkey suit is to put, to go back to the place where you were wearing your monkey suit. And um, I sh I'm just thinking like, great, I said monkey suit. That's going to be, I'm going to be called a racist now. But- <laughs> your uniform is what I mean. And, and there's not a lot to do on base. That's fun. A lot of, you know, you're, you're the military is work and you have to have a separation from the military to fun. And if that's in the form of a grocery store and the form of a movie theater or a bowling alley or something recreational to bring to the community or just improving the parks or having a community center, that's what I wanted to bring to DuPont. And I had just because I'm in the business world and have attended, you know, chamber of commerce meetings, have heard from people that have said, I tried to bring my business to DuPont. I tried to bring, you know, something fun to do to DuPont and I was shut down. And, and if I wasn't shut down, there were so many roadblocks that I had to go through to get my business in there that I just gave up. And I took my business to a, to Tacoma or I took it to Lacey. Yeah. So two things. So, um, Jared Warren, he owns the five brewery in DuPont, right? Mm -hmm. He's about the story. He had to get the mayor, my, what's the name of Mike Quartz back then? The mayor Mike Quartz had to get personally involved to get, get, get those stuff down. If the mayor would have got involved, he wouldn't be in business right now. There's so much hassle. And then, I don't know there's two, but more than one person said this. If you want to lease a business, a place downtown, their rate is the same as downtown Seattle. Yeah, it's it's insane. And um, as, as you know, a lot of the military receives BAH for housing. So it's a set rate that determines the type of housing that they can get. And they're really not making that much money. I don't know the last time they got a COLA, a cost of living increase. I don't know when the last time um, a race has been done. But with inflation, especially in the cost of food increasing, you have less money to spend on fun things. And, and the debt is going up like crazy. And people also don't realize that consumer debt is increasing, but our economy is good. How can that happen? Yeah, two you plus know? Two four, exactly. You know? And um, so- people don't realize in order to really be business friendly, if we are a community that wants to provide for the military, there's so many military spouses that have wonderful business ideas. There's so many retirees or veterans like yourself that have wonderful business ideas. And that needs to be affordable. And you need, you need a, a segue in to get started before you can become profitable. And you got to test out your business plan for that first year. And then you got to identify things that need to change and you need to be able to change those things to make your, uh, keep yourself profitable. You're not going in business to fail. You're going in yeah. business to succeed for the longevity of it, not just until your lease runs out. And if lease or the cost of your lease is your biggest negative or your biggest threat to your business, there's a problem. And, um, uh, anyways, that deterred so many business owners. They were like, why would I come to DuPont when the population hates us anyways? Yeah, there's so many business downtown. It's like, for example, uh, uh, do you ever go to Brewski's? Yeah. I can't believe they closed down. I know they had really good pizza. Every time I went there, there yeah. were packed it was lunch. I worked camp the day, whatever it was, it was always packed. Yeah. I still can't believe they closed down. Yeah. Like, I, I don't... Yeah. Frank, um, Frank Diaz owns 10 Hat Barbecue in DuPont excellent barbecue place. He is an investor in food trucks. He's going to start a, a pizza food truck for rallies. I just had for the other day. And to be honest, a, a few, I think when for first started a long time ago, I wasn't a fan of their pizza, but I just had them again the other day and they must've done something different. Cause I am such a huge fan now. And, um, I was a huge fan of, of brewskis as well. And Frank is going to have a pizza truck out with, I think, um, the Neapolitan style pizza, which is what I'm a fan of, but 
It's so sad to see businesses fail. It's sad to see the turnover. That's the ones that seem like they're succeeding. Exactly. You know, it's like if you go by Noah's ever written, okay, I get it. But like, Ruski's had people there all the time. Well, and, and it's just the demographic. If you are investing in a business in the city of DuPont and you're paying Seattle prices, you expect to have Seattle traffic. Now that's not the case because so many businesses are closing down in Seattle because of crime and other reasons, but you want traffic that's going to bring revenue into your business. And unfortunately, we don't have that in DuPont because one, we have a reputation of being an anti-business community, um, but also what people don't realize is those businesses are paying the majority of your taxes and keeping your property taxes from increasing. So we have to have a balance. I certainly don't want DuPont to become... A, a central for yeah we're, we're gonna be five junior yeah we don't want to be five junior and we and that was another misconception is that oh you know, Susanna wants to bring in more warehouses no I don't I just want to bring in things that families and kids and people that don't want to get back into the uniform or people that just took off their uniform don't want to go back on base for I just want to bring more amenities to our community so that we can see each other outside of the home when everyone's in a remote situation and um, there's there's a, a small percentage of people there um, that kind of control the roost because they are a big voting population that want to keep DuPont small and and that's fine. And until if I've learned anything, it's you know you have to cater to those that vote. And until the audience becomes more voters that want to see change you're going to get the same results because yeah, always, it's going to be the same voting demographic. I always joke around DuPont has been in two camps. One camp wants to be in the 1950s. Other camp wants to be in the ABC or 2020. Right now, the camp in the 1950s wins every time. Yeah, yeah. And my parents love that, right? And I, I'm also kind of split on that because I love the safety of DuPont. I, My parents being elder, I don't want my parents to live in an unsafe area. We moved actually out of Lakewood to the city. We moved Lakewood to still come to DuPont. And DuPont is by far the safest area that we've There's ever never, lived. Many scenes that for you walk drive down the street, you see kids on a bike by themselves. You know that's like very rare now. Exactly. That's everyday occurrence in DuPont. Yeah, and not only that, but I mean, when you have a, a high military population, almost everybody's going to be a registered gun owner. Mm -hmm. So you have very there's little. That, there's that too. <laughs> yeah, you have very. I I have a pistol in my nightstand. You know, I'm I'm probably going to get a shotgun just to have something that sounds more awesome. You know, if I need it. I, I just want that sound to be the deterrence that I don't have to use it. But um, I don't want my parents to live in an unsafe community. I don't want my parents to be exposed to that. So I understand the concern of growth and, and having more amenities attracting um, outside people, but it also ties into investing into your police departments. Let's stop defunding the people that we rely on to protect our neighborhoods Right now, our police force, by no choice of their own, is reactive versus proactive. Proactive policing does deter crime. Um, it's not the solution for all crime. Crime still, crime still occurs because police officers can't be everywhere all at once. And you obviously have limited people that, that are on staff. But it's a balance. And there's a way to do that balance. And I, I don't like the polarizing aspect of it has to be either or it can be a balance, but we have to do it all. To, I mean, literally all together, city, state, local and state officials have to work together. Citizens need to voice their concerns, obviously, but it's also not fair to have one small group um, dominate, the conversation. dominate the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if this is true. Um, I, I would bet money it is. So supposedly back in the day when McDonald's, before McDonald's came, they talked about having McDonald's come. The citizens of DuPont said McDonald's going to come as long as they're not a, like a play place. Because they were like, we don't want people bring their kids to DuPont to stay as long as DuPont they have. Just come, come to DuPont, get your food and leave. I don't know if that's true. I have heard that said from a small group of people. Um, obviously, people I think that go to McDonald's either live local or they are coming, getting their food and they're leaving. Um, we don't have a community center in DuPont. You know, obviously those things cost money. But there's not a lot to do in DuPont. No. There's the benefit of living in DuPont is that it is safe and that you do have families that generally are watching their kids and good good family structure at the home. But to, my friend moved out of DuPont to Tacoma just to have more stuff to do. You know, and it's like, I feel her pain and she has a family, but she wanted, she's like, I just got home from work. I took off my uniform. I don't want to go back on base. 
I don't want to go to the commissary every time I need milk or I forget one little item. And we have an awesome, Mince Mercantile is awesome. I love going there. And and I, there is a monopoly, I think, that small businesses in our community can have, and we can structure it in a way to where we're not competing against each other. But we just, we have to have the conversation. It's not fair for the small group to have the majority and control that conversation. And it's it's not fair to do it behind um, the guise of saying that we're we're doing this to protect our city. I know. One yeah. thing gets to me too, like whenever like I-5 has this accident is backed up, all the traffic goes to Steelacum, the back way. People are like always complain. I'm like, these businesses should be out there with signs saying, here, come take a break, you know, because that's traffic you, you might yeah. see you once in a month, right? Yeah, for sure. And like no one takes advantage of it, I don't think. Well, when you think about it, there's not, we have two main restaurants, you know, Ferrelli's and McNamara's right there on the corner. That's just high visibility for traffic. And, but other than that, you know, it would be great to kind of see a small business in there. That's a restaurant succeed. You know, if my mom was 40 years younger, there's no doubt that she'd open up a Korean restaurant there. You know, we have sushi, we have teriyaki. And I mean, I would love to see some pho in there. I'd love to see a, 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 Dunkin' Donuts, but that's a whole nother story. Yeah. They're they're never coming to Washington, but um, things that can be franchised, but also things that just bring the community together, something that brings us out of our homes into the community. And, you know, our city council does do a great job of of hosting events. Um, however, there is still a lot to to be desired. One, one of my big pets, people like DuPont, like people in DuPont, I'm general, overgeneralizing here. They're like, this is the best place for kids, but God forbid they become teenagers. Yeah. And they just want to get rid of them, right? These changes are out, you know, like, it's this, like one time a few years ago, uh, it, it's, it was, it's funny, it's not funny. So I guess for a Halloween prank, a bunch of kids, or I'm assuming kids, right? Eggs and cars, right? And these parents were on the Facebook, the police chief to inter, uh, interrogate other kids, bring them in, who did this? I'm like, dude, like, it wasn't, it wasn't a drive by shooting or nothing. Now, in these parents' defense, you know, you like, you throw one egg at a car. These children threw like a whole cart of egg at the one car. Yeah. So it was, yeah. Yeah. And now, you know, I, I don't know how long ago that was, but if you think about how lucky are we to be able to call the cops on eggs? Yeah, exactly. Versus calling the cops on actual crimes. Yeah. And there's actual crime that does happen in DuPont. Mm -hmm. You know, crime still occurs in DuPont, not on the scale of the other cities in the district, but it certainly still happens. And there's so many other things that we can do to prevent crime from deterring. So like, like your cars at night. Yeah. Lock, lock your car <laughs> at night. And I mean, granted everyone forgets, right? Like yeah. there's been a couple of times that I've, I've forgotten, but yeah, during the campaign, my car got broken into my neighbor's car got broken into, you know, I, I called the non-emergency line because it's like, it's already happened. My life is not being threatened. And I, just, I said like, Hey, at your leisure, you know, if you can come and make a report, it would be great. Because I understand that there is a 10,000 population, there's 10,000 people in DuPont, there's other people that have more pressing things going on. I certainly don't feel like I should be the priority with that kind of crime. So going back to your DuPont race that you lost, what are some things that you would have done differently? And would you think that that might would have changed the outcome? I think I would have, um, oh, that's really hard because you know, the the woman that I ran against, she's lived in DuPont for such a long time and people automatically assumed, and there was, I guess, some drama that involved her and the previous mayor. And I got the mayor's endorsement, the previous mayor's endorsement. So people automatically assumed, oh, you're running, you're running against her. It's like, no, I'm not running against her. We're both running for city council. We both want to serve our community. And it, it got turned to this me versus her situation. And I don't think there is any way I could have prevented that. Um, you know, I knocked on doors. I, I did everything I was supposed to do. I think the disadvantage in DuPont is that the conservative vote or the military population, and I know it's not fair to bridge those two together because not everyone in the military is conservative, but because a large percentage of, of that population does not vote and the 30% that's not military, that's not military affiliated does vote, they are end up being the decision makers for everybody else. Um, so I would just... It's, it's a bigger problem than I alone can handle. It's always wonderful when you have a commander in chief or when you have an administration that encourages vote where you're stationed because it has the laws that are passed have local impacts on your family while you're being stationed there. And there's a, you know, 
soldiers want to keep their home of record and their voting registration the same because they think it has to be linked together. And that's not the case. So I think if anything, I'm just taking those lessons learned about why people don't vote and trying to apply those to help everyone be heard. And that's not just, I'm not assuming everyone is going to vote Republican in that community, but I just want them to vote. Like just, I just don't want the small population to control the conversation for everyone. And so that's important for all, for all areas is let's just, let's stop being bullied. But the only way that we can stop being bullied is if we stop not taking action. We have to take action and we have to vote. That's the action that we can take. So after your New Park City race, the Republican Party reached out to you, right? Yeah. Now, did the Democrats reach out to you or only the Republicans? I, I had a few Democrats reach out to me that asked me if I was a Democrat. And, and I think the assumption is that if you're a minority, if you're a female, if you're a veteran, that you should be because you check those boxes. And I have... I have friends on every political spectrum, every religious spectrum. I'm I'm friends with people that don't believe in God at all. I've, I'm friends with people that are not Christian. I'm friends with people that are liberal and I have friends that are Democrats. I choose to surround myself with people that have opposing views or different views. I don't like echo chambers because <clears throat> I can look in the mirror and talk to myself. I don't wanna hear same thoughts. For venting, it's always wonderful to surround yourself with a group of friends that understand where you're coming from, but. Yeah, so so the Lakewood Women's Republican Club reached out to me specifically, and my mom has been volunteering with them forever. And they said, no, we're so sorry about the DuPont City Council race, but would you be interested in running for that state representative position? And I was still a little bit bitter, you know, from losing, obviously. And so I, I thought about it, and then they did polling, and it seemed like the right thing to do. And you always think, or at least people tell you everything happens for a reason, but they only tell you that when you lose something, you know, no one says that to a winner. And so um, I was thinking, well, maybe this is why, maybe this is why I lost DuPont City Council is because I'm meant to do something different, maybe on a bigger scale with a little bit more influence. And so the polling looked right. The numbers looked right. I was in a, a different spot. Obviously COVID had, had progressed a little bit. So in-person things were just... Um, becoming the norm again. And it's something I was passionate about. I didn't want to let failure dictate my next step. I wanted, I'm not a quitter and that might be a, a detriment. That's probably my biggest fault is I should probably give up on things a little bit sooner, but I didn't want politics, especially to be something that I quit on. Not for me, but for people that were sharing their stories with me on both sides of the aisle. And, um, and that was before I decided that I was going to jump into it. And then after you jump into it and you go door knocking and you meet more people in the community when they actually open the door and when they don't slam the door and when they're actually sharing stuff with you is they are sharing some very personal stories. And this is about drug use. This is about a crime that's happened to them. This is about their son or daughter that had been killed. This is about drug or alcoholism that they've experienced, that they've had to go through hoops to getting treatment for. They're still struggling with it. Um, abortion, gun rights, everything. And your job as a state representative is to represent all of the people in your district. I was running as a Republican. So yes, I'm a Republican and I have those values, but my job was to represent everyone. So I listened to everyone's stories. That didn't mean I agreed with them, but that meant if I was elected, I'd have to ensure that they had a seat at the table or that whatever cause they cared about was at least brought forth. You talk about this. I think a lot of people believe the state of Washington is liberal, but in fact, and disagree me if you want to, if I think I'm wrong, but and actually, it's only Seattle to Olympia, the I 5 court is very liberal. Most of us say it's actually pretty conservative, right? Yeah. So there's a, obviously Seattle is, is very liberal, very Democrat heavy. Um, people move to Seattle because of that. And businesses fail because of that. And crime increases because of that. It's not the only reason, but it's a huge part of the reason. Down in Olympia, the same thing. And I always find it ironic, the closer I get to the Capitol, the more homeless encampments I see. And in my opinion, it should be the opposite. Like we're going towards the government. We're going towards the house of the people. We should see people thriving, not homeless encampments along I-5. I mean, for the longest time, the city, the city council said Seattle was nothing but a homeless camp. For the longest yeah. time they finally made it out. 
Yeah. And you see it being down here in Pioneer Square. You know, people like to post on Facebook, look at the before and after, before a homeless encampment, after, look at, it's all clean. Two weeks from now, is that homeless encampment back? Are we just putting band-aids on the problem? Yeah. Are we just moving homeless people from one area to the, to the next? And it's not really the encampment that's the problem. It's we need to do something to treat the core of why people are homeless. And some people are choosing to be homeless. They're choosing to be homeless as a way of life. We need to find a way to relocate them to an area to where they can coexist with society, but also not hinder with people that choose to have safe streets, not walk on drug needles, not walk on human feces, et cetera. So you talk about the defending the police before, which of course controversial kind of topic. Yeah. My, my thing with this, like, you know, defending the police, like, I think, I think they need more training, more money, more training, right? to train correctly um and so with the defund the police one thing we get me like they a lot of police probably got to fund it and all crammer up no one who said defund the police no let's have a way to fix it right it's like they almost disappeared yeah so defunding the police was you can see it on graphs you can and i think i posted about this on facebook and it's a chart that i, I believe the pierce county council or maybe it was a pierce county police chief that that posted it and it's you see the policies that are impacted that either defunds the police or restricts their ability to do their job or not pursue. And then immediately, as soon as that law takes effect, you see the increase in crime. And that's personal property, that's assault and burglary, that's um, anything, anything pertaining to what police can and cannot do. And, and one, when you defund the police, you are painting, let me back up. The reason why people wanted to defund the police is because of the actions of few. And those few should be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. I am not excusing their behavior by any means. Those people need to, to go through the justice system, need to be held accountable. Those people do not have any place in law enforcement, nor should they ever. To, to play it back on, on what cops are exposed to on a daily basis that does not excuse their behavior, but to play it back to be considerate of what cops are exposed to, especially in urban areas where they're being cussed at, spit on, stabbed, shot at, whatever the case may be, when they're trying to keep you safe, they're trying to keep you safe and you are shooting at them. And they keep coming back and they keep putting the uniform on and their families say goodbye to them again every single day. And it's a risk, just like when you're in the military, you don't know if that's going to be your last day at war. You don't know if that's going to be your first and your last day at war. You just don't know what's going to happen. It's unpredictable when you choose to serve. How do we make the police more accountable? It's like the so-called the blue line they hide behind or whatever. Like Right. right. Yeah. The, everyone needs to be held accountable by laws. And you, you touched on it with training. And so I certainly, the reallocation of funds to go towards training is absolutely essential. I don't think we should have defunded. I think we should have increased the amount of funds because you end up deterring a lot of the good police officers that have been serving, that have been exposed to the cursing, the crime every single day and continue to put the uniform on. Those people get like morally just down. It's like, it sucks to put on the uniform. I don't want to do this anymore. No one respects me. I'm my my personal property is at risk if I get sued for making one mistake and an unintentional mistake. And then also they, they quit and then crime continues to increase. So defunding the police does not do anything to stop crime. You can, however, everyone needs training on a consistent basis. We always should be looking at how we can do things the least invasive but we also should be looking at how we can prevent crimes. What's driving criminals to yeah. to do crime in the first place? I definitely place. think most police need a better class of more training on dis dis escalation. Like you, I mean, how, how many times you been pulled over and, and they're like getting mad at you or you know they escalate instead of dis escalating? Yeah, I definitely train on that. Another thing too, um, agree. Like I don't, we definitely don't need any kind of like national police force, but it has to be some kind of standard training. Like example, where I'm from, Odessa, Texas, to be a, a, a police officer, you need like a six month academy. In Arlington, Texas, you have to have a four-year degree in criminal justice, right? So it's all this like varying degrees, you know, there's something needs to be done like that. But again, I'm not saying we, we definitely need like a national police force or just the same standards. But man, this is too many variables out there, I think. Yeah. And the tough part is, is that you have human people move, right? So you serve in, in Chicago, for example, where you're, you have to be aggressive on a daily basis because that's 
that might be the culture of that police officer, that detective for a given amount of time in that specific area. And then they come to the city of DuPont where it's like Pleasantville and they pull you over and you're like, whoa, dude, like take a chill pill. Like, but you don't know that person just came from Chicago. And because there is a difference of standards, you know, I totally agree. I, I don't think we need a national police force, but I do think we need training that is specific to the area. We need cultural training. We do need sensitivity training. Whatever training that needs to be done, let's do it. Let's get that with the input of the community with minorities that feel that there is social injustice. Everybody needs to be at that table. But the one thing that we can't waver on is the law is the law, no matter what, if you're wearing the uniform or if you're not wearing the uniform, the law is the law. And that's something that we, we can't wait on. So for your, your, so you ran for the district, state district 28. Yeah. Unfortunately, you didn't go off you either. Right. Any lessons learned or anything you learned from that that you do differently? So many lessons learned. Um, I'm actually really proud of the campaign. I'm proud that I had People on both sides of the aisle support me. Because I could be wrong. Didn't you get more votes for Republican than like, like in a long time? I got more Democrat votes, actually, um, than a lot of my Republican colleagues. But with that being said, the abortion issue after Roe v. Wade, again, these are things that were out of my control. And I talked about this last night on a panel that I sat on is after Roe v. Wade was overturned, the Democrat narrative is that Republicans want to take away your right to women's health. Women's health means that's a broad statement. Women's health is, is such a broad umbrella. And the, the tough thing is, is when you're in a blue state, you, you know, that's not true. Like I've never heard one Republican elected official or candidate say, I want to take away women's health, or I want to take away women's rights. I've never heard that said, but if there's one candidate in Kentucky or in a red state that says that, it gets blasted. And that hurts a candidate like myself or a candidate in a blue state that's a common sense conservative because we get painted with that broad stroke. And if our party doesn't come together and have a collective message or brand on our stance on abortion, then we let the Democrats control the, the narrative on we're basically, basically our silence is saying, yep, that's true. And so I chose to talk about it myself and one other candidate in Pierce County chose to talk about, no, we, your right to an abortion has been protected since before Roe v. Wade, Washington approved that law. They made it state law in 1970. And that law is not going anywhere. And now they want to codify it in our constitution. And the, the negative thing is that people don't realize that it's, this also includes late-term abortion. So that means up until birth. I don't know what people's opinions on that, but in my opinion, that's a little extreme. My job as a state representative is not to force my opinion on you. My job as a state representative is to ensure that you know all of your options and to put it on the ballot so that you can vote on it, the people can vote on it. But on the other aspect of it is the narrative again is, Republicans want to take away women's rights. Republicans want to take away women's health options. That that was just not the case. And a, and a simple case of even if it's med medically nece necessary, they were saying that we wanted to take away your right to an abortion, which is not true. It, doctors will will do it if your life is at risk. There's no question. There's no. And I shared a personal story about it, and I I said, you know, I was five months pregnant. My my baby didn't have a heartbeat anymore, and the doctor. My husband was a physician, knew my OB, and it was as simple as, hey, you can wait for a miscarriage to happen, but if you wait, you're going to be putting your life at risk. We can do a medical abortion. And medical terminology, a miscarriage is a spontaneous abortion. And the, and the point is, people are, Republicans and Democrats don't get this. When the narrative is that Republicans want to take away your rights, your human rights, your health choice rights... I'm going to share a personal story to understand that's not to just show that's not the case. This is a medically necess this is medically necessary. This is not something that's in jeopardy here. And the since the law is protected, your rights even if it's not medically necessary are still protected. But we we can't come together as a party and have a stance on that or have a collective message because the red districts that are not in jeopardy 
control the narrative and the blue districts that are in jeopardy are at the consequence of being silent or because we can't come up with collective messaging. That's really sad. So talk about this, not just for abortion, but for every issue there is. Yeah. Uh, we're using abortion to talk about, right? It's like the Republicans on the far right side, they believe every person on the left is getting abortions every day just for the hell of it. And you have liberals who think that the Republicans want to do just what you said. Yeah. And neither is true, right? Neither both, is true. Both of them have this all or nothing philosophy. And most people in the middle are like, no, we, like common sense stuff, right? Right. I mean, I'm from a belief you've got rid of 1% of the left and 1% of the right, everything be a lot better. Yeah. So um, politics is so polarizing. And if you only focus on the media, you would think that we hate each other. And there is, just like you mentioned, there's a small population on the right and a, on the far right, I'll say, and a small population on the far left, and they do hate each other. But those are the small groups that are controlling the conversation for everyone else. And we have to get off of social media and we have to talk face-to-face -to, -face to each other and we have to educate ourselves on the issues so that we're not leaving it up to politicians so that I don't have to leave it up to the RNC or to the state party or even to my local district or county to come up with a message so that when we're talking face-to-face -to, -face to each other, we know that that's not true. And we're not having conversations with each other anymore because we're all remote. It's easier to go through social media. And we're all scared of being canceled still. And we need to get out of that. Like Comedy is such a big thing, right? Like I love going to stand-up comedy shows and the, the death of comedy is being politically correct or the fear of being canceled. And if we can't do that, you know, if I'm fearful of losing my job, you know, or if I'm fearful of losing a group of friends, we all need to remember that you're not the base. The constitution is the base. So if you think that because you're donating the most money or you're volunteering the most, that your opinion matters more than anyone else's, that's not true. We have to stick to the laws in our state. And if we want to change those laws, we have to win. And we're not going to win if we have an extremist message. Can you talk about how, like, if you're a Republican, Republican of Washington, you might not be a Republican, you're probably not a Republican in Texas, right? Or if you're a liberal in Texas, you're probably not a liberal in Washington, right? Can you talk about how each state has their own flavor of Republican, Democrat? Yeah, that's very true. And I, I think in, <laughs> in Washington, you know, I talk to my friends that live in Florida and, and live in Texas, um, and they're like, man, your, your Republican isn't the same as my Republican. Like, I can't even believe you're talking about abortion up there. And I'm like, I can't afford not to talk about abortion. Like it's, it's the law and, and people are lying saying that we're trying to break the law. We just can't do it. And um, then I have my friends in Texas that are like, I would, I would never, I would never be that brave to talk about abortion. I would never talk about my own miscarriage. I would never do this. And again, this is not, this is not everyone, but this is the people that are in politics. Or I've had people say to me, if I talk about this, I'm going to lose my donors because they are 100% pro-choice or they are 100% pro-life. And if I pick a side, I'm going to lose that money to fund my campaign. And we don't have to be pro-choice or pro-life. We just have to respect the law in Washington state. And, the, and what Roe v. Wade did is give the rights back to the state. So if you're in that state, and you feel one way or the other, and your state doesn't agree with you, that's that's a hard topic. But the only way it's going to get changed is if you win elections, and you're not going to win if you are 100% far in any direction. Just like you said, you have to have more of a moderate message. And, and I think the trouble for a lot of Republicans is, how do we deliver that moderate message and not lose our values, not lose what we stand for? And it's, it's really simple. It's, we got to take off the scarlet letter R and we have to have conversations as humans. I'm not going to introduce myself to everyone I meet as, hi, I'm Susanna Kyleman. <laughs> I'm a Republican or hi, I'm Susanna Kyleman. I'm a Christian. I'm Susanna Kyleman and I'm human. I want to know about you. Tell me about you. If you're a candidate and you're at the door and you're talking about yourself, or if you're a Republican and you're talking about yourself, or if you're a Christian and you're talking about yourself, that shows the other person you don't care about what's important to them. We need to listen more than we're talking. I know when the Roe v. Wade was overturned, I know a lot of Democrats like making all the noise, whatever, but they got all the crazy too. They had like, that since like 19, Roe v. Wade was first over, over done like 72, I think, 73. They have like 73 to like a couple of years ago, like codify, make law, whatever, and they never did. And then um, 
when President Trump won and Hillary lost, for, for whatever reason, like a lot of females know didn't vote for Hillary because of whatever reason, but because Trump won, President Trump won, he had to put three justices on the Supreme Court. Those three judges help overturn what we read, right? So I think the lesson is like, you got to take care of your opportunities you can, right? If you're Democrat or Republican, I think. And I, I assume it's going to be like that forever. <clears throat> Absolutely. And and that's why more common sense people need to get involved in politics. And if you look at a lot of politicians, they are professional politicians. They've been an elected official for years. And by doing so, by not having term limits on a lot of these positions, you lose track with the community because you're not at the park with them. You're not seeing the homeless encampments. You're not talking to the people that are struggling with alcoholism and drug addiction. And when you're at when you're in DC the majority of your life and you're not in the community that you're supposed to be representing, that's when you get the disconnect. But and then it's also having a a ripple effect in that people that that want change will automatically listen to that narrative that they're a victim because they see you in DC just being a DC politician. When they have a grassroots leader or activist that's in their community saying you're a victim, look at what your politician's not doing or look at what he's doing. And if you're only at the country club and if you're only in DC and you're only um, in politics to socialize and you're not doing the grassroots things and volunteering in your community, you are feeding into that narrative and you're proving the other people right. And we need to stop proving people right. Yeah, like I don't believe in term limits, but then I was like, sometimes, man, maybe we do need term limits, right? Because a term limit, like you vote for somebody out, right? But if you if you used to like, you know, Jason Cameron's on the ballot every single time, and you don't know the other person, like who are you going to vote for, right? So, and then again, it's like, why is he people like in the office all the time? Because they, you know, quote unquote, represent their people, right? Even though a, a state representative in Kentucky might be something opposite of where you want in Seattle, they're doing what their people want. So I just think it's a mixed bag. I don't think it's an easy answer. Yeah, there's definitely not an easy answer, but I do think if there's not term limits that all politicians can do a better job, whether you're a candidate, a, a grassroots leader, an activist on, again, getting out of your echo chamber, reaching out to your community to see, okay, what you're obviously very upset about something, which means you're passionate about something. Tell me more about that to help me better understand the issue. Cause all I'm seeing is this Facebook red rhetoric or this, this hate message from you that you absolutely hate me. And Again, if we make it about ourselves, we're, we're never going to grow the party. We have to make it about the cause. And the cause is nonpartisan. Everybody cares about the cause, right? And we have to be more about that. How do we solve this? I think one of the reasons most qualified people don't want to run because they're, they're afraid that they run for office. Oh, Jason Cavanaugh's back in, you know, 1992, he stole Snickers Bar in school or like <laughs> all this stuff comes out, all these talents and come right. I know everyone has lives right now. Everyone makes mistakes. Yeah. But no one wants to have the scrutiny. Like, how do you, how, is there a way to fix that you think? Yeah. For me, like, I just own it. Like, everyone is human. And I think the more that you want to keep concealed, the more people see that you're not authentic, especially if it ends up coming out later. And like, yeah, I've been, I've been married before. I've been divorced before. BFD, everyone, almost everyone has been there. And it wasn't the plan. Obviously, I, I didn't get married to get divorced, but it happened. And I, I'm so lucky that I'm still cordial and have a good friendship with my ex, but I'm not going to hide it because it's not the typical, it doesn't fit into a mold of what someone wants me to be. If anything, it makes me more human. And, you know, when I was deployed, you know, I have some really embarrassing stories that happened to me. And when I tell those stories, people want to hear those things. They want to know that you're human and that you fell on your face and that you broke your nose. And they want to hear that you had to drink, you know, out of the grog bowl, out of a boot that you're sergeant major was wearing all day and they want to hear that you puked afterwards and they just want to know that you're human and i think the more that we try to pretend that we're perfect the more people see right through it and and people are tired of the fakeness people want someone that's going to be authentic and i'm the first to admit that i'm not perfect and i'm still actually working on finding myself so that i can be more authentic but i'm not going to find myself if i'm not in tune with my community cuz we are not meant to be alone. We're meant to be social creatures and we're, we're meant to thrive off of each other and help each other. And opportunity is, is basically filling a gap, right? And filling a gap for someone else. It's not filling a gap for yourself. It's you providing a solution or it's you providing an opportunity to fill those gaps so that other people can succeed. So I know this would never happen, but I would pay money if this happened. Like suppose I'm, I'm a pro candidate, and I'm, I'm doing a speech and some reporter says, uh, Jason, can you tell me back how back in so-and-so day you did this and this? I reply, 
yes, but remember when you did this and this and this, I just think it'd be so cool. Like the can like has some during the reporter sometime, right? Throw it out there, right? <laughs> right. Of course, it'll never happen. But I think we could go to SNL skills about, you know, like, oh, that is true. But did you know your, your wife was out last night partying in Vegas with some guys or whatever, you know? Of course, that would never happen, but I yeah. think it'd be funny. Um, so not the exact same, but the, the best that I could do during my campaign is you have these news outlets and um, some news outlets, you just know that they're not going to endorse you no matter what, because you have your, your Republican tag associated with your name. So they're like, we're never going to endorse a Republican. We never have, we never will. But the endorsement process is, you know, you, you do an interview and you get asked questions and it's, it's not hard at all. You just, it's like any forum. Um, and I was getting advice from people in and out of politics, like, don't waste your time. They're not going to endorse you anyway. And some people are like, no, you should do it because at least if there's a conservative Democrat out there, you might get their vote. Or if there's an independent, you might get their vote. And so I, I would post about, um, I would repost this specific news outlet ended up endorsing the incumbent that, that won the election and that I ran against. And they endorsed him based on solutions for crime. And so I went back and I reposted every crime that. story that, that. Yeah. that that the incumbent had supported that led to the crime. And so I was just like, it, it's just a little ironic that you are posting and reporting on this crime that the incumbent voted for the policies that sparked this crime, but you're endorsing this incumbent on solutions for crime. Unbelievable. Yeah. So it's easy for me, right? Or someone with common sense to kind of see the obvious, that's hypocritical. But to them, they're they're like, oh, I'm, we're sticking it to her. We're giving it to her good. And it's it's like, no, you're actually proving my point even more. And anyone with common sense can see that. And I think that's why a lot of people have lost trust in these bigger media outlets and why independent journalists like Brandy Cruz are taking off. Yeah. yeah I'm a big fan of Brandy Cruz. Yeah. And, and like news is like, I don't know, like, like CNN, I mean, what they they call the Clown News Network, Fox News. Now they're admitting that they knew Trump was making stuff up, you know. And like, um, what's the name? Tucker Carlson was caught on a text saying that you know he had to say stuff so customers wouldn't go to Newsmax. I mean, this is craziness. Yeah, and and that's also another reason why we need to get out of our echo chambers. And part I know saying that is easier said than done because it's so hard to find credible sources of information, but. All I can say is keep an open mind, know that information is always, someone is always digging for more information for the truth. In the end, the truth always comes out. It's better to be ahead of it. It's better to own your mistakes as a candidate. It's, you know, I'm, there's so many things. I, I think time is probably the biggest thing I wish I would have, I wish I would have left my job sooner and campaigned full-time since the beginning, because the stories that people share with you when they donate $1, because that's all they can afford, that $1 donation is almost means more to me than the $10,000 check. $10,000 check is going to make stuff happen. But the $1 donation from that person that's struggling, that's making minimum wage, that's walking five miles to their job, that's on food stamps, that's been struggling with substance abuse, that $1 is like everything that they have. And for them to give it to you, and to share their story with you, that's why I wanted to win for them. And to not win is just like, it's so heartbreaking, but that's why you just have to, I can't think about giving back or listening as I can only do that as a politician because anyone can do it. Anyone can volunteer in their community. Anyone can give back. So with Brandon Cruz, it drives me, it makes you laugh sometimes like you're on the know on Twitter, right? She's a, she's a work actor on Twitter. Liberal for because you, you're being a conservative Republican, conservative Republican because you've been a liberal. Like she must be doing something right if both sides are going after her like that. Well, she sticks to common sense. And I, I think that's common sense is not always Democrat. Probably. Common sense is not always Republican. Common sense can be, ooh, that kind of hurt to hear, you know. And the truth is not always going to tickle your fancy. The truth is something that you need to hear. And um, one of my friends was saying the other day, like part of being a good advocate is telling people what they need to hear or giving people what they need, not what they want. Yeah. And that sounds like common sense, right? And and you're like, yeah, duh, you know, but you have to be reminded of those common sense things and you have to remember your why. And you don't remember your why when you're when you're so far removed from the community that no one is sharing those personal stories with you. So when you ran for a state representative, 
there were several times where you posted you went to your old apartment in Lakewood and uh, left left notes. Did, they, did, they, did you ever get in contact with those people or whatever came with that? Or? No, yeah, they never um, they never reached out to me. And it was such a bummer because when we used to live there, the very first step of the apartment um, to go up the stairs was shaky. And this was like years ago. I was in the fifth grade, I think, when we lived there. And so I'd always have to step on the right part of the stair first and then balance it out with my left foot on the other side, or I would just skip that step altogether. And when I went back to door knock, I tested the step and it for sure had not been fixed. And that was like just from years ago. Mr. Ben never got in touch with you. So next we're going to play it like sort of a game, right? Okay. So we're going to assume that you're, that you won the election, that you're in the state of representative right now. And we're going to go with some issues. What a tease. So first one, um, economy. If you're in there right now, how, how would you handle, what would you, you take that economy? What would you be doing with that? Yeah. So we had, I think it was like a $15 billion surplus um, during COVID that got brought in. And the first thing that I would do is provide tax relief. I think the biggest thing in the 28th is we can reduce the sales tax. So that would have been, that would have been the first thing that I would have done is reduce the sales tax. And if there's other, depending on how much of the budget is left over, give that back to the people, either in the form of a stimulus or in, in a program that they need. So if there's communities out there that need, like the city of DuPont if, or the city of Lakewood, where I grew up right outside of the base, that that area you know, is called many things. And I didn't know- None of them are good. None of them are good. And I didn't even know all of the different nicknames for that area that I grew up in until I did a ride along with the Lakewood PD. And it wasn't even the police officer, the detective that I was doing the ride along with that would that told me it was when we would pull people over or when I'd get out of the car and, you know, listen to what they had to say, listening to the people that were being asked questions, they would refer to their own neighborhood as these names. And so I'm like, really? How long is so I started asking around and they're like, oh yeah, we've been calling it that for like years. And I'm like, what do you mean years? Like, oh, for at least 50 years. And I'm just like, I had no clue when I'm, you know, growing up on Chicago Avenue, I had, I just had no clue, but yeah. So you just give it back to the people you give it back in. And some, I don't always believe in stimulus checks because we're creatures of habit, right? We want yeah. instant gratification. It's probably we, inflation now. Yeah. Why, what are you going to do with that money? So if, if we could invest into community centers, into programs that actually have KPIs, how is this program going to work? How are we going to measure the effectiveness that this program is working? Is it the reduced crime rate? Is it um, decreased kidnappings by keeping kids off of the street? Is it decreased gang activity? How are we measuring the success of this program? But reducing taxes is, is the first thing I would have. Said. So what would you say is the number one economic problem? Inflation, Inflation, cost of living, the biggest thing. We do have a housing issue, obviously. The problem with the 28th specifically is that we're already so developed. So it's, we're having to look at um, creative ways on how to incorporate more housing. And it's now tending to be like attached living dwelling units and um, being more creative with, you know, mother-in-law suites. Can you build a mother-in-law suite above your garage? Can you have retail on the first floor? And then can, can you have residences above that? Um, there's so many challenges, but the city, the city council, if you are listening to the people, you already know what those concerns are, but yeah. So next, public safety. What do you what, what do you be doing about public safety if you're in there right now? Yeah. So uh, repeal and replace the laws. Um, the do not pursuit bill is is getting some traction to be revisited again, and that's all because people are were protesting on the steps, and unfortunately, there were some lives lost because of this do not pursuit bill. And people need it's it's always a law, right? Until no, it happens insane. to you. Like, if I was a criminal, I would love that law. Right? It's in, yeah. It's like I, 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 it's just telling me I do a crime. I see I run away. You can't chase me. Like, yeah. I'll, what criminal is going to say, hey, stop? No. Nah. Well, and police officers now and detectives, when they pull you over, they're almost like they feel bad because you actually stopped and then they have to give you a ticket. They almost feel bad for giving you a ticket because they're just so happy you pulled over. And you're most likely a law abiding citizen yeah. that like ran a red light or were speeding or were on your way to work or something like that versus the criminal that has a record that is kidnapping someone that you can't pursue them because of the laws and people. People die. People have died because of that. Why do you think this area is so, I hate to say use the word anti-police, but so little like anti-law enforcement? It's it's the actions of few that punish the majority of the crowd. And like I said, 
those actions are inexcusable. Those people should be held accountable. If they, it doesn't matter if you're wearing the uniform or not wearing the uniform. If you break the law, you break the law and you should not be taking advantage of a situation. Social media is a, a huge part, right? Like when you see the clips on Facebook or on TikTok or on Instagram, you are seeing a snippet. By second out of probably a 20 minute thing. Exactly. You don't know what happened that led up to the police officer having to use force. You don't know what happened. You, you just don't know what happened before that five seconds. And when you're only seeing that five seconds of the police officer having to use force or defend themselves, of course, it's going to look horrible. You don't have the narrative behind it. So next, homelessness. We talked about this some before. I'm a firm believer you like, I think some people want to be, I won't say, I won't say, use the term, they want to be homeless, like they're comfortable with it, right? They have the lifestyle, they, you know, but then again, you know, you see people on the drugs and all the mental illness and stuff. And my thing is like, I know in Seattle, they've thrown at least millions and millions of dollars on it, right? And it seems like it's getting worse. So I don't know. What's, what's your take? How do you fix it? Yeah. So first you, you have to stop throwing money at the problem. And people think that when you stop funding something, that means that you don't care and that you're just leaving these people to die. But I truly believe that sometimes you have to stop and you have to take a pause. Where are the existing resources going? If you can't track down a dollar to where it's going and you can't measure the effectiveness of that dollar, that program's not effective. Everything a taxpayer pays into should should have a tracking progress. It really should be like when you order something on Amazon and you're able to track the order. It should be like Uber Eats. Like you order something, you can see your delivery driver and that should be the same way with our tax dollars. I'm paying property tax. And if you look on your city um, website, your city of DuPont website, they do a really good job of breaking down the dollars so you see where your property taxes are going. But it's the same way for when you pay sales tax. It's the same way when you pay federal taxes. Any tax that you pay, you should be able to pull up where that dollar is going. And then you need to be able to hold that dollar accountable. So show me, show me that that money went to that homeless person or to that, to that village or to the, to give single mother's baby formula or to give mother's baby formula, period. And not to pay like 2,500 people with six figure salaries. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I'm a firm believer. Everybody needs to pay taxes. I am not sticking up for the people that are, um, that are, are rich and successful, but I also don't think that the rich and successful need to be penalized either. As long as they're paying their fair share and, and we can debate all day long about what a fair share is, but also you paying taxes, whether if I'm making $60,000 a year, which is the average household income in the city of Lakewood, I think it's a little bit more than 60,000 a year. If I'm making 60,000 a year and I'm paying taxes, I almost want more accountability than that person that's making a million dollars a year because my, my money is less. I want to know if I'm paying $500 out of every paycheck, show me where that $500 is going. And I want to have a return on that investment. So if I'm driving over the same pothole every day to get to work and I end up getting a flat tire, to me, it shows me there's something wrong. If that pothole has been there for 30 years, there's something wrong. If there's a homeless person that has been struggling with substance abuse or mental health disorders, and we are closing down our state hospitals like Western State and the city of Lakewood, there's something wrong. And we continue to fund these programs, but we're closing down these institutions. There's something wrong. And so we have to first just kind of stop, take a pause, stop funding these issues so that we can assess where the problem is. It's a temporary pause. Yes, people will suffer, but that's where you have the grassroots organizations step in. Grassroots saves when government fails. I see it all the time. And that's a, that's a real shame. The fact that we need grassroots organizations is just a fact. It is just proof that government organizations are not the solution to everything. I agree. So next, talk about some talk about housing. So I want to ask you about. I know recently it, 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 there's a lot of stuff about rent control going on. All right, right now. What do you think about rent control? Is that a solution? Bad thing? I know a lot. Of, well, mostly a lot of Republicans say it's not a good thing. I think I could be, I could be wrong about that. Yeah. So I'm. I have mixed views on this. Obviously, I'm a landlord. I have I have rental properties in the city of Lakewood or in the city of DuPont. And I want to be able to have my mortgage covered by being a landlord. That's the so, whole point. So that's a good point. Like when COVID came out, there was always programs like renters, right? 
But I was like, what about the landlords, right? Right. I mean, you still got to pay your mortgage, right? Yeah. No one gave you gave you a break, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so you have to look at it from the aspect of a landlord, and you have to look at it from the aspect of a tenant. If if you are homeless and the only thing that's standing in your way is affordable housing, then I do think that there needs to be affordable housing. But I don't think it's the um, the property owner's responsibility to have solutions for government failures. That's the whole point of uh, being a capitalist. That's the whole point of being an entrepreneur. That's the whole point of being in business for yourself is to be profitable or at least have your investment covered. And for myself, I, you know, with, with the property that I rent out, it covers my mortgage and my HOA and, and DuPont, you know, we have two HOAs. It covers just that and nothing more. So I think I might have a profit of like 25 bucks a month. If that, that's nothing, you know, and I don't think it's fair to penalize the person that's renting out the home with rent control measures. I think we knew we do need solutions to provide affordable housing, but I, I think it should be left up to whoever the landlord is on if they want to opt in or opt out of that. But it certainly shouldn't be forced. So we're talking about abortion some. So as you mentioned, there's like the thing in the state of Washington to make it like a make it cut off, like make it part of the state constitution amendment. What's your what's your what's your view on that? It's it's not needed. It's unnecessary. And <clears throat> If it's not codified in the Constitution, it will be because the Democrats are using it as a tool to further divide the party, further divide the Republican Party, um, and further use it as a tool to have a one up on Republicans as long as and and all we have to do as Republicans is come together with messaging and say, we understand it's state law, we're not going to do anything to take away that state law. What we are going to do is support those women who choose to give birth. Okay. Um, anything else you want to say about abortion before we move on? Uh, it's do your research. You know, Republicans support women's health. Republicans support women's rights. No one, we understand it's a state law and it has been a state law since 1970. It really is a non issue. What we want to focus on is how we can best support women, period, whether they choose to choose to have kids or not. We want women to succeed just as much as Democrats want women to succeed. And it, they're making it a divisive issue. Um, and Republicans, we do need to do a better job of saying that we care. We need to do a better job of showing up because if we don't, again, we let them control the narrative. Yes. Yeah, so the next one, um, decriminalized drugs. And what I mean, what I'm talking specifically about is, uh, of course, marijuana is already, already decriminalized here, specifically about like what's called psychedelics, LSD, mushrooms. We're not talking about cocaine or heroin or fentanyl. Those need to be like, those need to stay illegal. Mm -hmm. But what's your take on like decriminalizing stuff like um, psychedelics? Because there is like, Recognition for this research out there says it actually does good for depression, PSD, those kind of things. So working in clinical research, I, I have a little bit of an advantage to to actually know of studies that are being done. Um, I if if it goes through the clinical research process and it has a positive outcome for someone that's going through that, it absolutely should be approved. And we have to also do of um, there's a lot of like brain wiring that has been done over the past. 40, 50 years to talk about how bad these things have been. And now we're looking into science to actually prove that those are good things that we can use for benefit. And so I think our biggest hurdle is going to be um, to legitimize the science to say, hey, look, this has gone through a research process. This is legit. This is actually we don't need these pharmaceutical pills. These are these are natural things that are organic that are taken from the earth that are doing a much better job than any pill that can be prescribed. I'm sure the government's going to find a way to regulate it, which they should. But um, as long as it is for as long as the outcome is positive, you know, I support it 100. percent You hear like this is the more mainstream. You hear like people like you know Aaron Rodgers, Green Bay, Bay Packers quarterback, doing his um I can't know how soccer trip whatever it's called. I can't say the word. He's being a psychedelic, you know. The ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, yeah. yeah that, you know, he did that, you know. So it's more mainstream, so to speak, right? Yeah, I, I haven't done it. I know people that have and come away from it with positive experiences. You know, if I don't, I don't judge. You know, if you want to do something like that and you're not providing, it, it's not causing harm for someone else and it's your own spiritual journey to becoming a better person or getting through something, then do it. I think we need to get over these stigmas that people that do it are are horrible people or they're liberals or they're, you know, into witchcraft or some, something. Some like whacked that. out, whacked out hippie, you yeah. know. 
I mean, we live in Washington state. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, we are a hippie state. We yeah. are. So what's next for you as far as your political career? I actually don't know. Um, I am all about trying to help the party improve where they can, when they can. And so, so you're pretty active in the party right now? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm active in the local races. You know, there's a, a lot of, a lot of races tend to get the majority of, I would, I wouldn't say a lot. Some few races get the majority of attention and it takes away from races that need attention. And the 27th district, my friend Jelani, former gang member, has overcome such adversity. You know, I actually follow him on TikTok. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's, yeah he's, a, he's, he's definitely a character. He's definitely a character. But for him to have his political views now, and I don't agree with all the political view that Jelani has, but we respect no, he's, each other. No, he's, no, he's very conservative. Yeah. Like he's, yeah. He's probably more conservative than I actually um but I I love that guy I would take a bullet for that guy and and people didn't invest what they should have because they said it was a, a unwinnable race and if we continue on that path it's never going to be a winnable race and so we need to if we are not donating our money we need to donate our time and time is is so valuable in districts like the 27th yeah like I guess when people say unwinnable race, race, like of course the state of Texas, the governor has been Republican since 1994. Well, people forget when Bush won the 94 election, he had been Democrat the previous 30 years. So when he ran, it was says unwinnable. He ran against Ann Richards, a real proper liberal, you know, Democrat, very populist. And he won Republicans have been since right. So only you only have to win it one time, right? I think a lot of people forget that. Yeah. And I think also what Jelani and other candidates and and Pierce County specifically have learned is we, it's always nice when you have the support of the RNC and of your state party and, and of any kind of donor that's a Republican, but we also can't win if we don't have that same kind of support from those independent voters or from, from soft Democrats. But the most important thing is you don't need it. It's always nice to have it, but you don't need it. If you have people that really believe in you, that is your core support. Support base and you don't have to buy support if that makes sense. How, how do we fix this? Or maybe it doesn't need to be fixed. Like, of course, the presidential election comes. You know, I won't say everybody, but more people vote. The lower down you get, less people vote. You know, how do we get because politics is local? How do we get people to actually vote in the, the city council, the school board, you know, those local elections? It's it's really a hard one. Democrats do. This is where Democrats win over Republicans all the time. Um, Democrats go into schools. Democrats are doing better at social marketing to people excited and to actually what Clinton did that was really great. You know, went on MTV and and played the saxophone. He really appealed to the younger voters. And the Republican Party has a reputation of being the older, the older what you explained with the VFW, the older population and. We're, we're going to continue to lose if we don't get in touch with social, if we don't embrace social media. Um, and that was a huge, that was probably my biggest lesson or feat is I, I, I'm not a huge fan of social media. You have to do it to, to stay relevant. I didn't have a personal Facebook page before I got involved in politics. I honestly wish I didn't have to have one now, but you have to post so that people know that you still care. And the people that are on there um, we'll know that you're doing it for good intentions and, and you're doing it for good intentions. I'm, but I do think there's such a thing as overexposure. And until I kind of figure out, get my feet from underneath me from losing two elections and, and figure out what makes me happy and things like that. I, I don't want to be on social media as much because I want to focus on, I need to, I need to be secure in who I am as a person. If I want to be anyone's leader, because campaigning is so hard and um, but it's rewarding you know there's risk reward and you got to pay to play and you have to knock on doors and be yelled at you stand there and you're yelled at like someone is yelling at you because you are responsible for everything bad that has ever happened to them and I've stood there and been yelled at and I've had doors slammed in my face and um but then for every door like that there's someone who's like oh my gosh thank you for running you know, I appreciate you and you can't have a weak, um, you can't have doubts about yourself. You can't be mentally weak. You cannot be mentally weak. And that will, I say is the great thing about having a Korean mom is she has never, she has never 
Your mama raised no punks. As she say. did not raise a punk. And I mean, it's still like, I'm human, obviously, like it would be nice to, you know, like have like, oh, good job. But she's always like, no, what can you do next? What can you do better? What can you do faster? And, um, you know, if I lost something, even at school in volleyball or tennis, if I lost, it's like, you need to practice more. You know, it was never like, oh, you'll get them next time. She's like, she's like, I never wanted to raise you. I never wanted to say you'll get them next time because if you didn't practice, you weren't going to get them next time. And so having that mindset being raised by a Korean mom really kind of thickened my skin a little um, to handle politics. But if you're only campaigning and you're and you're only being a candidate, you kind of lose sight of of your why and who you are as a person. And I think I need to get back to that myself so that the next time I I do run for something, whether it be next year or then or you know, some somewhere down the line in the future that I have that core un, unrockable foundation. So that way I can take another slam door in my face. So this is in my opinion. I think as a country, the last thing we need is a President Joe Biden versus President Donald Trump election in yeah, 2024. Yeah, I agree. I mean, how do we prevent that? Because I, I don't think there's anyone, the Democrat going against Joe Biden. Some lady did. She's like some, some journalist knows I heard of. And of course, it might be Trump or DeSantis. How do we, how do we as a country, like, man, we need to do better than Trump Biden again? Yeah, I, I think it's just like what we're talking about is having these conversations. So I voted for Trump, and I, but it's more that I didn't vote for Hillary. I voted for Trump because I wasn't voting for Hillary. That doesn't mean I am a fan of the guy. I am a fan of a lot of the principles. I've always said that Trump is, is presidential in policy, but not in character. <laughs> And that's what I appreciate about him. However, in a blue state like ours, he's not good for elections like mine or for races like mine at the local level because we all get looped into this, um, whether it's true or not, we all get looped into anything good or anything bad that ever happened with him. And it more tends to be on the bad side. I've. It's also disheartening because Nikki Haley is a, a, a wonderful, capable candidate, in my opinion. We had an opportunity to have another capable, strong, intelligent, fearless woman be the Speaker of the House, and we missed that opportunity. And there's so many missed opportunities um, that are happening, that have happened, that continue to happen. We need to encourage our own party to continue to challenge ourselves. Um, there is no one size fits all Republican. And I think as soon as we realize that, the sooner we can say, okay, we have our differences, but here's what we need to do to advance the party. Here's what we need to do to win. And some of that may just be optics, but at the end of the day, we can't make change if we don't win elections. And the wonderful thing, the great thing that I envy about Democrats is how well they're able to campaign together. They, who knows, they might hate each other behind the scenes, but when it comes to face value, they're all on one piece of paper saying, here, vote for us. And we can't do that. Not Republicans. Yeah. I know it, it'd be interesting if it's, it's a, if it's President Trump and DeSantis going against each other. But they always, always like to have this hate, hate relationship with each other, you know. I, I was fortunate to have DeSantis as um, my congressman when we had a place down in Daytona. And I had some issues that I was dealing with from the VA that I had reached out to my other local officials for. And when I reached out to DeSantis, I mean, I was working on this issue for years trying to get it handled. And um, I reached out to DeSantis's office and he was able to have it handled within five minutes. And it happened again. And same thing, it happened in five minutes. Right. His office solved it. So from personal experience, and I know, know people that are with them in the military and they've had nothing but wonderful things to say about him. So just based on my personal experience, I'm I'm a huge fan I don't like that people, um, there are obviously some commonalities. There's some common traits between him and, and former President Trump. But I really, I, at the end of the day, I want, I want the most capable person to win. I don't want us to turn into a woke party to where we're saying a woman has to win because she's a woman. I want the woman to win because she's the most capable. And we need to, we need to all be on board with that. So he hasn't, he hasn't like said he's running for president yet because I think he's Iowa, one of the places. And he took like a, like a little side gig at, at President Trump. He's like, in Florida, we do this, we do that. And we do it without the palace fatigue and all the drama. Yeah. We just take care of business. Like, man, that's a, 
nice little side swipe. Well, if if you think about it, the way that he presents himself, the character, right? That's that's the presidential part. Is he doesn't put up with BS, but he doesn't do it in a way that President Trump did it. And and I think when you're the leader of the free world, you do have his appeal was also the thing that killed him in the end. Is you know he he had the attitude where it's like. I don't care. I don't care. I don't need your money. I don't need the lobbyist money. I can do this myself. And which was great because that means he wasn't a puppet. And then on the other side of it, it's like, okay, let's dial it in a little bit. Let's get off yeah. Twitter. Uh, I still say some more just took him off Twitter. He'd probably still be president right now. Well, and I'm there's a firm believer in that. Yeah. And a lot of people would agree with you. And, and I'm not saying this because I believe it, but I will say that there's a lot of people that are concerned about the integrity of the elections and we can't blow those people off. We can't say you're crazy if you feel like your vote's being jeopardized. We have to acknowledge the voting process. We have to acknowledge um, and reassure them that there is integrity in elections. But if we are just, if we listen to the concerns of people and we call them crazy because of it, we're going to lose. Yeah. That's when we lose Republicans. And that's when we get Republicans that don't even vote when they don't even feel heard in their own party. So Zan, is there anything I said I asked you that I haven't asked you or anything else you want me to ask you or anything else you want to talk about? Um, no, I think we covered it all. I knew when I came here that you were going to ask me some hard questions and I was prepared for that. And I, I appreciate it so much, Jason. Thanks for having me here. Yes. Um, can you share your social media for people who can reach out to you? Yeah. So I still have my political campaign page up. Um, it's just Suzanne Eilman, you'll find it on there. And I think you can Google Susanna Kyleman, Washington or Seattle Kyleman DuPont. And Kyleman is K-E-I-L-M-A-N. Um, so yeah, look me up. And if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you, especially if you're in the community. If you um, if you want to, to chat or if you have something that you want to share about some adversity that you've overcome, I'd love to hear. And if there's anything that you think I can help with, let me know. And so before we get out of here, any last minute advice on any subject you want to talk about? Um, if you are thinking about getting involved in politics, please reach out to your local district party members. Please reach out to candidates that have been there before. Please do not think that you are not qualified. We need more. We need more regular people to be involved in politics so that we don't have these politicians that are out of touch. Susanna, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.